Brooke, do you want my glasses? Hey. No. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Brooke. I got them. I started off like that, too. Yeah, I just turned it off. Yeah. I started right. off. So now who are we waiting? We're waiting for Janae um, and Eric. And Eric. Is Eric back? Yes, Eric is back. Well, physically. <laughs> We had a conversation about this meeting yesterday. Do we want to see where they're at? Or I just text Jenny and answer me. Oh, we can just start. It's okay. We can start. Well, it's mostly 30. All right. Well, I'd say thank you to uh, Vanessa and Brooke for coming out and uh, meeting with me before. We're talking about what they can, what kind of services and training they can bring to our drivers, to our mechanics, our assistants, and you know, just we're help us to better work with our students who have special needs and some of our preschool kiddos, some of our younger younger age kiddos. And so, again, it was uh, actually a fun meeting. I said I, I got those uh, Apollo Peños, and thank you so oh, much. Oh, yay. Oh, good. Good. Nice. <laughs> <They're quite good. laughs> She's still asking for I'm like, no, sorry. Go ahead, Greg. But thank you, ladies, for coming out and um, got the whole team here. And we look forward to your presentation. Thank you oh, so much. Thank you so much for having us, Greg. We appreciate it. So we're really excited to talk with you guys today. But I just want to start out. I know um, I I met some of you, and I know some of you. But um, maybe if we could just go around the room. <laughs> But maybe we could just go around the room and you guys can um, tell me your name and how you're associated with that. Uh, I say to a seat. You said you were. I will start. I you know, know me. You. I'm Jennifer Fox. I work with your mom, Josie, up at West. But I also work in the training department. Great. And I'm DJ Schultz. I'm at Central Transportation. And uh, I know, I work at in the training department. Great. So my name is Valerie Polk, and I work in Greg's office, and I oversee the training. Awesome. Okay. I'm Michelle Venice North Area Transportation Director. Okay. Nice. And I know you well. <laughs> Sandy Gallegos, and I work in Greg's office. I'm the transportation analyst. Money. All right. <laughs> I like it. Okay. Nice to you. Eric Stein. I uh, work in the training department at, at South Area. I'm Kathy Nelson, director of the South Area. Hi. Josie Gallagher, director of the West Terminal. And yes, it's my own. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I'm uh, Linda Hayden. I work in Greg's office. I'm a fleet analyst. Awesome. Uh, Paul Cuff, I'm the new fleet manager. I was uh, a couple of months ago. And I'm um, out of Central. I work along with Greg in his office. Great. Greg. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Well, my name is Vanessa Valentine. Um, I went to Colorado State University. I graduated there with a degree in human development and family studies, and my emphasis was early childhood education. Um, and fresh out of there, literally the moments before I graduated, I got a job at Bell Swan, um, and I've been there ever since. And so we've done a lot of work in PPA. So. Uh, the Pyramid Plus approach, we're really excited to share with you some knowledge that we've learned and how it might be able to help you guys. And this is my partner in crime, <coughs> Brooke Brogel, and I'll let her introduce herself. Uh, my name is Brooke Brogel, and I also teach at Bell Swan. I've been there for about eight years. Vanessa and I are here today because we're on a journey becoming certified pyramid trainers, but it's something that we've been doing for a long time at Bell Swan because Bell Swan is a demonstration site for the pyramid, which means people from all over the state can come to our school and watch how teachers are implementing these practices in a classroom setting and take that back to their preschool or transportation division or wherever they're using it and implement some of those same strategies. So, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Brooke, will you just check that camera just to make sure? So part of our um, credentials is that we have to videotape it, so the person that is our kind of let us know what, how we messed up and how we can fix it and make it better. So, um, so basically we're going to give you guys a brief introduction. So before we can get started, we always want to thank the funders that fund the Pyramid, Pyramid Plus approach. Um, so without them, we couldn't do the work that we do, so we always just want to give them special thanks. Um, so basically today you're going to understand the purpose and the objectives of the Pyramid Plus Center, what, how, how they run things and what they're all about and what their purpose is. And you're going to understand how the practice maybe can be applied to what you guys do with bus drivers and assistants and how you guys can help kiddos on the bus. Um, and then we're also going to talk about options for implementation and how we may be able to help you guys get some training done. 
um, and promote that positive behavior and help with that driver retention. So this is kind of the dry part, but um, I also have some handouts for you guys. So I will leave these with Greg. Um, these are a little bit more in-depth packets um, on the history of Pyramid Plus. This is just kind of a brief rundown, but I, I can always make you guys more copies if you need more of those. Um, but in 2001, U.S. Head Start and Child Care Bureau was funded to center on social, emotional, and foundation for early learning, better known as CEPHAL. So if you guys hear us use that acronym, that's what it stands for. And the U.S. Department of Education funded the Technical Assistance Center for Social and Emotional Interventions. And that acronym we call TAXI. So if you ever use those, that's the breakdown. If you ask me what it meant on its own, I can't even tell you. I just call it TAXI. So. Um, and then in 2005, Colorado was selected as a CEPHAL pyramid model state, um, and the Interagency Pyramid Model Partnership was formed. So they kind of came together and formed that. Um, and then in 06 and 07, um, they came together and they trained 350 people and 13 coaches um, and selected three demonstration sites. So basically, they went in and they tried those practices to see if they were best practices. They took data on it and made sure that they were actually working and made a difference with children. Um, and then October 1st, 2009, they came together, uh, Pyramid Plus, the Center, the Colorado Center for Social Emotional Competence and Inclusion was launched. And so they kind of took both entities and made one. And that's how Pyramid Plus approach was made. And so basically they took that entity and made sure that inclusion was in it and tried these practices with not only typical learning children, but children with special needs as well. Um, so some community history that's already doing Pyramid Plus. The city of Lakewood funded for all of the Head Start preschools to implement these practices within their classrooms. So they, we had trainers come in and train them, and then we had coaches come in and help in the classroom to make sure that the practices were being done to fidelity. Um, so they've been in implementing this program for over three years now. Uh, there's a director, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, but it's called Mulholm Preschool, um, and it's a Jefferson County Public Preschool. Um, and the director there is a certified um, trainer for this exact practice. So she's in your community with that. So some things you guys are already doing, you guys are already doing that inclusive bus driving. You guys are transporting all those students with special needs to places like Fletcher Miller, and basically everywhere is my understanding. Any child that has special needs um, gets wherever they need to go thanks to you guys. So that, that's great. Um, you guys are already training drivers on child development and social emotional needs. Um, every two weeks that you guys have been doing. Um, you guys have funding for professional development in place. You guys have a training department. Um, that's just amazing that you guys, that you have Valerie here to help you guys get all the training you guys need to get those bus drivers ready to go. Um, and another great thing is you guys value that relationship between the bus drivers and students. And we saw that with the People Helping Drivers program, which we learned a little bit about, so that's great. Um, so some prevalence data is why this work is so important. Um, I'm just gonna throw out a couple facts at you guys. Um, so faculty in higher education early childhood programs report that their graduates are least likely to be prepared to work with children with persistently challenging behaviors, which is kind of scary because they're coming out and they're ready to work in the workforce and they feel like, you know, if a child's exhibiting those challenging behaviors, really they might not be prepared to work with those kids. Um, preschool children are three times more likely to be expelled than children's grades K through 12. Um, that statistic is shocking, but it's so true. Um, it's alarming, you know, we always think of seniors being the ones that are expelled or not coming back to school or maybe those junior high kids, but actually preschoolers are the ones that are most at risk for expulsion. Um, but there's evidence-based what? I was just going to add on to yeah. that stat because it is truly important because it's a trajectory for your kids that you're seeing the rest of their time in their elementary, middle school, and high school career. So if they're already starting off with a stigma of being a child who's been expelled from school, it just goes into a bad place from there and it's really hard for them to recover from those stigmas. So the more intervention we can have with kids in kindergarten and preschool to get them on a great path, yeah. um, the easier your job's going to be in the future. So. Exactly. And two, that's their first taste of school and if they've been kicked out of a couple preschools to go to kindergarten, it might not sound like the funnest thing to them. And I'm sure teachers talk and information is dealt out and you know they definitely get that word passed on to kind of follow them. Bus um, drivers do the same thing. Yeah. They start talking and know, sharing. Sorry, do we know why the preschool children are getting I mean I wouldn't think a preschool child is it just because they don't know that basically um, my understanding is that they 
they basically don't have the skills to deal with these children that are exhibiting challenging behaviors. Mm -hmm. They might have, um, it might be a child with special needs, or it might be a child that's biting, it might be a child that's spitting, um, but rather than addressing the behaviors and trying to figure out why is that child exhibiting this behavior, the easy way out is to just kick them out of preschool because they don't have the resources or knowledge to help them. Yeah. So and that's why in elementary school, when you guys get these kids on the bus and you're having to review tapes, that might be part of the problem is that they're, they've already had this issues, issues in, preschool. in preschool. Yeah, so it's kind of wow. it's shocking. But the good news is it doesn't have to be that way. We can change that trajectory. Um, the problem's not what to do, but rest in assuring access into intervention and support. So really getting this knowledge out there and how can we help these kids? What skills do these, these teachers need and how can we help them? Um, so it's really important. So this is just some raw data, and thank you guys to everyone who emailed back and got us some. Um, we really appreciate it. This is just some raw data. We know that in Jefferson, the Jefferson County District, you guys are serving 88 elementary students or schools, 36 middle and high schools, and three K through eight. So that's a lot. You guys are a huge, huge district. Um, some rough data: we got 62% driver turnover rate, um, 2,000 to training driver. Thank you, Valerie, for that too. We appreciate it. Um, so roughly we came up with $160,000 per department for new driver training um, each year. And then 12 to 20 suspensions per month per department off the bus. Um, challenge behavior just requires so much time, energy, and effort from your bus drivers, from your directors. You know, you guys are talking to principals, you guys are talking to teachers, the students themselves, reviewing tapes. It just takes a lot of time, energy, effort, and money. Um, and then we do know that you guys do have a program in place, the People Helping Drivers Program for Challenging Behavior. So what do we do as adults when children don't have these skills? If a child doesn't know how to read, we teach. And if a child doesn't know how to swim, we teach. And if a child doesn't know how to multiply, we teach. And if a child doesn't know how to drive, we teach. And if a child doesn't know how to behave, we do we teach or do we punish? Um, and it's really interesting trying to answer that question. And why can't we answer that one as easy, easily as the other ones? Um, when we first started doing this work and this was presented to us, I thought this was so powerful, um, even as a mom, because right away you have these expectations of what you want them to do, but they can't do it if they've never been taught it. And so to kind of look at it from that perspective is so powerful. So if they are exhibiting challenging behaviors, we can empower them and teach them a new behavior as to what we want them to do, what is appropriate, what's okay to do. So, Because kids aren't hardwired to do those things. Kids aren't hardwired to sit still. They're not hardwired to be quiet. They're hardwired to be curious and moving and doing all those things. And until we show them specifically what we want them to do, not just telling them what we don't want them to do, they, it's hard for them to comply. And truly, kids want to please adults. They really do, but they often don't know how because we don't give them specific information on what we want them to do. It's so true, Brooke said. Um, so Everett and Gus have got to go to Valve Swan for the last um, three years. Everett, Gus was two years, now he's at a different preschool. But I remember one time, you know, you kind of know all this stuff, but you kind of fall off the train and. I was telling him, nope, don't do that, nope, don't do that, come on Everett, don't do that. Finally kind of threw his hands there, well, what can I do? Because he's so used to school telling them, this is what you can do. So he was so true, it's like, oh, I know this, okay, here's your options, here's your choices. So um, it's, it's very true. So this is looking at the pyramid as a whole. So I'm just gonna kind of go through it and tell you guys about how our framework is set up. Um, but we were all about promoting social emotional competence and addressing that challenging behavior. So it always starts with the bottom here, an effective workforce. That's why you guys have them go through training. That's why you guys have these departments. That's why you guys have these meetings to make sure you guys are collaborating and talking to each other. Um, so really our hope is that with the bus drivers is that they'll all have these systems in place, these policies in place. They'll not just be one driver on a route. They'll really work, on, work as a team, a cohesive unit. And so let's say if that kid goes to a different route with a new bus driver, or if they all go on different routes, they're used to the same practices that are in place on all the school buses, and they feel like it's kind of one unit. Because um, we all know we all like to do our things our own way, and that's okay. But it's really nice if bus drivers can collaborate and say, oh, you know, I tried this with Johnny, this worked really well, this is what he needs, and it's really nice to have that collaboration piece. 
Um, so it all starts with that effective workforce, which you guys do such a great job with already. Um, the next part of it is that nurturing and responsive relationships. If you think about a child, even as when you were a child, all the relationships they have, they have their, their peers, they have their siblings, they have their parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents. Not all of those relationships are nurturing and responsive. And many of those relationships, in fact, all of them shape the people who we are today. That's what shapes us. It shapes our character. It shapes how we feel about ourselves, our self-worth, our confidence. And so <coughs> even as a bus driver, they start their day with that child and they get to end that day. And if they develop a nurturing and responsive relationship with all those kids on the bus, they're going to see such a decrease in this challenging behavior piece. And that always depends on that effective workforce. Because if we don't teach the bus drivers how to do that nurturing and responsive relationship, how that, what that looks like. Maybe they've never been around kids or it's been a really long time. What does that look like? It might be a simple wave hello or a thumbs up, but really what does that look like for a nurturing a responsive relationship? And that's with all children. That's with children with special needs. That's with children that are spitting and that are exhibiting challenging behaviors. It's with every child. How do we make sure that child that is pushing our hot buttons, we still give them that nurturing a responsive relationship? Um, the next tier is that high quality supportive environments. That's like you guys train the bus drivers to go back, check the seats, make sure none of those high schoolers left looking naughty for the little ones to find. You know, that's, that environment is safe for them. The bus is clean. And with that going is great. There's always these great things that we can post for them. They know what they're supposed to be doing if we post the expectations and they can see pictures. So really giving them that way to navigate their environment by being independent. Maybe there's a little sign that shows kindergartners sit in this row or high schoolers sit back here but really giving them that environment where they can navigate it on that own and it promotes that independence piece. Um, the target social emotionals is, is um, where we actually are going to prevent those kids. It's that kids that we know that they might exhibit that challenging behavior, but we're gonna prevent it before it happens. And Brooke's gonna talk a lot more about that. But it's all systematics in place. And what's great about that is it can change from bus to bus. Maybe one bus has a problem with children bullying on the bus. And so you can put a systematic in place to prevent that bullying from happening. Or maybe it's volume control. Maybe this is a bus full of kids that love to scream. So we can put a systematic approach in place, these embedded learning opportunities for these children to prevent that from happening. So really, it's, this is great. Brooke's going to talk a lot more about that. But it's great because it can be so individualized for what these children need. Um, if all these are in place, if you have your effective workforce and they're doing running great and doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, and you have these nurturing responsive relationships, you have these high supportive environments, you have these systematics in place to prevent that, those children at risk, you're only gonna see about 1% of all children at the top of this pyramid. Those are the kids that exhibit those challenging behaviors. You're only gonna see 1%. And to think what if you have a bus of 50% of the students are all being a challenge to you, if we can break that down to 1%, that would be so powerful for the bus drivers. You know, I feel like they wouldn't feel so exhausted and tired. Um, because I know when my own kids are exhibiting challenging behaviors, it's like, ah, oh, okay, when's Jared gonna get home? <laughs> it's, it's hard, it's, it's really hard. hard. <laughs> yeah, or maybe call Gaga, I need a break. Because it's exhausting, it is so exhausting. So. I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so children are less likely to get, engage in problem behavior when they know what to do, how to do it, and what is expected. So at all times, whether they're at school, on the bus, or at home, children are gonna be on their best behavior when they know exactly what to do, how to do it, and what is expected. And how do we help them do that? So. So that's kind of the general framework of what the pyramid's about, and it's really a prevention piece. It's really front-loading and giving kids information that they need to know before they need to use it. And there's a lot of strategies. I can't, we could spend weeks talking about all the different strategies that you could um, pursue in the pyramid realm. But Vanessa and I have pulled together some strategies that we just want to focus with you on today to give you a little taste of what the pyramid's like and make it pertinent to what um, would be relevant for bus drivers. So the four key pyramid strategies that we think are most relevant for you are teaching the skills before they need to do it. It's the same thing like Vanessa was talking about. If you wanted to take your child swimming, you wouldn't just throw them in the pool and let them figure it out for themselves. You would show them the steps. This is what you do first. This is what you do next. The same thing goes for the bus. 
before a child even steps foot on the bus, we want to tell them, these are the rules, this is what we do. We keep our seat on the chair, we face forward, we keep our hands to ourselves. Tell them exactly what you want them to do, not what you don't want them to do. And we're going to give them opportunities to practice that, and they are kids and they're going to forget. So we are going to front load the environment with visuals. Because they are children, they're still practicing, they're learning how to operate in their body. So if we have pictures up that show them those four rules that we told them ahead of time with a picture, so that no matter what child it is, they don't have to speak English, they don't have to talk, they could be nonverbal, they could have special needs. It could be any child could refer back to these cues that are posted on the bus and they would know exactly what's expected of them and they can kind of self-regulate themselves because they don't need an adult to tell them what to do over and over again because they can remind themselves. So front-loading the environment is a huge pyramid um, technique and it's so successful. I teach two-year-olds, two and three-year-olds and we've got pictures all over our classroom because clearly two-year-olds can't read and a lot of the kids in our class can't talk. They can set up our routine of our, of our day by picture cards and they know exactly what we're doing it down to the minute. They're so perceptive. But when you give kids the information, they really thrive on it. So I think what you'll find is the bus can turn into a really exciting learning environment for kids. Um, that positive language piece is critical. If you guys took one thing away from the pyramid, I would say positive language. We're replacing no, stop, don't do that with what children can do. We're giving attention to the kids who are doing a great job. You are listening to my presentation and I can tell you're thinking, thank you so much. High fives go a long way for kids. Just feeding them with that attention instead of always addressing it to the kid who is popping up and down. What if the bus driver gave high fives to all the kids that were sitting down and thanked them or did something to encourage them? This alone transforms kids' behavior. I can't tell you how many times I've seen it. Kids want your attention and they'll do anything to get it. And kids are smart and they know that negative behavior often gets the most and the quickest attention from adults. If you bite by golly, you're going to have an adult right next to you giving you all the attention in the world. But what about that really great kid who's following all the rules? They never get any attention. Nobody ever says anything to them. And then the prevention strategies is just something we'll go through, like Vanessa was talking about. If you know that you've got a handful of kids who are maybe going to go off in a direction that you don't want them to go, we've got strategies in place to make it more valuable for them to follow the rules than to not follow the rules. Because it feels better. The, the reward they get makes them want to choose that. Sorry, so this, this got a little wonky on the transformation. But what I want you to think about for the pyramid is what if you considered your bus a classroom on wheels? Absolutely. It's important. What you're doing has such a powerful transformation on the kids in terms of teaching moments. You are their teacher from the time they leave the bus stop until you bring them to school. Oops. Oh, yeah. Smart board, if you catch it. Oh, oh. Back, back, arrow, and we'll take you back to where you need to go. So, throughout this whole time that your kids are on the bus, some of them, Jody and Sonny, can be on the bus for upwards of an hour. I mean, if, if, it, if it's a long trip, there are lots of teaching moments on this bus where you can add to these kids' skill sets so that when they get to the classroom, they're even more prepared. That you start them off with a great day because they've had these teaching moments. They've had the time to practice something, be successful at it, and get rewarded for it. So the bus, if you thought of it and you left today, is no longer just a bus. It's not just transportation. It's a classroom on wheels. It truly is. Okay. And so, like Vanessa was showing you, the things we're going to show you today really focus on this bottom piece of the pyramid. Because when you lay that really super solid foundation, when you give all kids the information, you're setting up everybody. Like I said, ESL kids, special needs kids, it doesn't matter. These, these um, techniques are good for every child on the playground. 
Um, and then you can spend what little time you, you need to spend. You can spend it addressing to the 1% of kids that rise to the top. But these four things are what we're going to show you today. That might be something, just use it as a thinking launch.